Good afternoon and thank you all for coming. Great to see so many people here. And welcome to the US Game Changer session on Amazon Studios. Uh, first of all, I want to thank our sponsors, Creative Scotland and the British Film Commission. And secondly, I want to thank our guest, Roy Price, head of Amazon Studios. Round of applause, please, for Roy. Over the next 45 minutes, we're going to... This is our first time at Edinburgh, so over the next 45 minutes, we're going to explore what is Amazon Studios, how does it work, what's it looking for, where does it fit into our universe. We're not going to do traditional Q&A. Instead, we're going to do something interactive and give you an opportunity to vote on some pilots towards the end. So, Amazon Studios started in, two, in 2010, based in LA, um, has a unique pilot process where customers get the ability to watch, rate, and comment on fully produced pilot episodes, and that feedback directly impacts whether or not those go ahead to series. And I think quite an interesting idea in terms of being ahead of the audience or following the audience. Uh, to date, Amazon Studios has produced 49 pilots, 17 of which have gone to series, so around one in three. I don't know how many of us who've been in the pilot business could argue we have a hit rate of of one in three. Mine certainly was much worse. Um, anyway, um, those shows include the Golden Globe uh, award-winning Transparent, which is up for 11 Emmy nominations this time around, the critically successful drama Bosch, the dramatic comedy Mozart in the Jungle, and the dark drama Hand of God, which some of you may have seen at lunchtime, and there is a further screening at the film house at 6 p.m. tonight if you didn't get to see it. Um, so before I start talking to, Ro, let's, uh, to Roy, let's have a look at uh, Amazon Studios. <laughs> I saw you looking at that like a proud parent. Yeah, no, it's been a great uh, couple of years. Very exciting. It's not bad for five years' work. Now, yeah. there's one show that a lot of people in here will, will have, you know, want to talk about, um, and that's Top Gear and Jeremy Clarkson. Bit of a coup for you, pulling that one off. Yeah, it's exciting. It's not about cars anymore, though. It's going to be a multi-camera sitcom. <laughs> I really wanted to do something different. I uh, heard that Jeremy was at that stage of his life. Yeah, yeah, make a change. Uh, no, we were very exciting, excited. Uh, you know, they have a global, passionate fan base. Um, so obviously hugely popular here, but, um, but also in the US and all over the place. And so that was exciting and came together quickly. And will that be part of your world in terms of Amazon Studios, or where will that fit into the Amazon world? Uh, we'll liaise with them. They're going to produce it here, and, um, uh, but we'll be in touch with them from Amazon Studios in LA. And how do I get it? Do I have to be an Amazon Prime subscriber, or can I just pay per view, or how's that going to work? You're not already an Amazon Prime subscriber? I am, Prime absolutely. Subscriber? Yeah, I am All already, right, yeah. Come on, everybody. I need next be. day delivery. Uh, excellent. Well, yeah, then now that's only part of it. Um, well, if you, you, you have to be, you'll have to be in Prime, okay. and, uh, and then you'll get it, and okay. that'll be awesome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, Jeff Bezos says it was a very, very... Very expensive deal. And he said that? He did say that. Oh, okay. Having had Top Gear as part of the BBC universe, I know that it's not cheap. Um, right. How are you going to measure success? Um, well, you know, we will observe how many people watch it. And, uh, you know, we're paying attention to how original shows drive uh, incremental subscribers. So how do they affect retention? Uh, do they appear to be influencing people to subscribe? So you look at all of that. Uh, is it enhancing engagement with the service, and are people talking about it? So we'll look at all of those. So it's not overnight, it's a totally different range no, of totally metrics. it's totally not overnight. I mean, you look at the overnights, you get it hourly, but, um, uh, but I think you look at a range of, of both the extent to which people are engaging with the show, and how perhaps you could argue it's, it's modifying, uh, you know, how people are responding to it. Now, 250 million is almost all of the BBC's production budget. No, not really. Mm -hmm. 250 million is a lot of money. Uh, is there going to be money left for other British commissions? You know, we, we also are running uh, the show Catastrophe in the US, which has been, uh, an, which has done awesome for us. Like, it's getting a ton of views. It's been 
uh, very, very well received. That was on Channel 4 here, wasn't That it? was on Channel 4 here. Yeah. It was originally developed at the BBC, I think. But, um, uh, but you know, great show, and I, I think there's more to come. So whenever we come to, uh, to London, there are a lot of interesting uh, meetings to be had. So I'd love to develop more shows, you know, out of the UK. And The Man in the High Castle is, you know, done by Scott Free, Ridley Scott's company, and it's written in London, and like half the cast is is British, so. That was it's, not the BBC. Yeah, and it was originally developed at the BBC. That's kind of our whole strategy, <laughs> is, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's shot in Canada, so, you know, is it an American show? Uh, UK show, I don't know, but there's do you, do you a care? ton of talent here. Do you I, don't care? Care. No, you don't care. I just want a great show. Okay. Yeah. So in terms of this world now of networks and Hulu and Netflix and Amazon, where do you fit into that world? What makes you different from the other guys? Um, well, you know, we're a, uh, a network, a distributor, and also a studio. Um, as a studio, we produce our own stuff, but we also um, have shows from, uh, from other studios, like Sony or whatever. Uh, so we'll function as a network in that way. And, um, you know, so we're all, we're all just sort of in the um, evolving TV business. Obviously, Hulu, Netflix, and us are all in the sort of on-demand part of, of the business. Um, and but Hulu um, has advertisers. You don't have advertisers. Yeah, they have advertisers, and well, they also have a subscription. We don't have advertising now. Netflix has a subscription. We have a broader subscription. Do you think you'll ever have a narrow Amazon Studios or Amazon TV subscription, or will it will always be part of Prime? I don't know. We're very focused on Prime and the collective value that that can bring for customers. So that's what we're super focused on now. Okay, now you don't do every genre, you do, what genres do you do? We do half hour, so adult comedy, uh, adult drama, uh, kids, so we do preschool, uh, which we didn't show in the video, but um, also kids, six to 11. Um, and so now we're doing factual, I suppose, with uh, uh, Jeremy's show and, um, we also have a factual show with The New Yorker that we're doing called The New Yorker Presents. But mainly we're, and we, we're in movies now as well, separately. Uh, but mainly we're doing, uh, on the TV side, uh, fiction. Yeah. Just to be clear, because Top Gear, we were class of entertainment. Really. Uh, okay. Um, All right. Well, uh, so you mainly, well, I just don't <laughs> want you to be swamped with factual proposals right, right, right. when you're not really in the, in the, what we would call factual space documentaries and yeah I think there's a little bit of like one thing at a time about it you know yeah. let's establish you know the comedy department the drama department get get that get that base of uh, comedy and drama shows and that's that's the phase we're in now what is your studio I've not been to your studio what does it look like does it look like where the BBC currently are which is like uh, an insurance headquarters with a newsroom in the basement or does it look like um, I don't know a big Hollywood lot well, it's really, really lavish. Uh, and, you know, uh, Those were the no, days. it looks like, I don't know, it looks kind of like some random startup with a lot of like cubicles and whiteboards and, uh, you know, and a few posters sort of taped to the wall. A bit scrappy. So it's really glamorous. <laughs> and, you know, no, I don't think people come to Amazon for the fantastic offices. Yeah, like BBC then. Um, yeah. So, you're working with Woody Allen. You're working with um, Gary Trudeau, cartoonist. He did Doonesbury. Mm -hmm. Was that a step change for you in terms of engaging those sorts of writers? Um, well, you know, I think it's part of our the vision that we've had from the beginning that um, you know there's already there's a lot of TV, and if you're going to add value, if you're really going to make it interesting. You have to create something that is really distinctive, that is worth talking about, that is going to be sustainably different and interesting and part of the conversation. And if that's going to be true, 
uh, it's really ultimately going to be about the vision and voice of a super talented creator. And so that's really at the heart of every show we do is you just want to get the most interesting, talented people who are passionate about doing something new and, uh, you know, and try to work with them on those shows. So whether it's Jill Soloway or uh, Woody Allen, you know, that's all, all part of one theme. You know, Steven Soderbergh, Whit Stillman. Um, you know, we don't really go after it with like premises in mind or sort of a rough format. Like I really want two people living in an apartment in New York or any sort of premise. Um, you know, I feel like once you, once you feel like you, you really, you know how to, how to make a show and you, you, you really know what you want, I fear that's the, that's the moment when you'll start uh, falling behind slightly because, um, you know, the new shows that are really great, that are game changers, are so often really rule breakers in some way. If you think back over the history of television, they defied, you know, conventional expectations. And um, so you can't, in, in my opinion, go into development with a really fleshed out model of like what you think of as a good show. You have to be open and exploring and I think focus more on uh, talent. And, and that's, been our, that's been our strategy so far. So staying with this talent point, it might be a good time to showcase one of those shows and, uh, and have a look at the Amazon Studios DNA. Um, so we're going to take a look at Hand of God. And maybe you can give us a brief introduction, and then we'll take the clip. Yeah, so Hand of God is a one-hour drama uh, starring Ron Perlman about a, um, a judge who's sort of a pillar of his community. And there's a horrific crime in his family. And he becomes obsessed with this and becomes a, a bit of a vigilante. I, I think it's, um, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a hard-hitting, involving mystery. And there are elements of um, he thinks that God is talking to him in this, in this struggle of his. And, and so there are questions about his sanity or his inspiration. And I think there are kind of some hot topics that you know, not everybody would take on, but the team had a, had a great, you know, very coherent vision for the show. Uh, it was smart, it was a grown-up show, and, um, and so we made the pilot, and people really responded to it, and it comes out on the fourth, as you said. Quite a strong religious angle. Do you think you have more freedom than the networks in the space that you're in? I mean, American network TV and cable is quite heavily sort of regulated, and I remember how you've got little squares saying what's in the content and not suitable for 12-year-olds. And Is it different for you in that online space? You know, I would say for whatever reason, there, there has been, there have been sort of certain, you know, uh, polite, non-controversial, and in the, in the worst case, in the bad case, sort of anodyne conventions of the television universe and the conversation about culture that, you know, that TV takes part in, um, in that, like, a lot of topics have been avoided, and there are things that you might write about in a novel, or you might talk about. It's part of life. Mm -hmm. It's not that people don't talk about it, um, but it, it isn't part of TV life, it, you know, which is, um, I suspect those things are, are going to erode over time. They're going to fade away, because uh, if they're interesting, if they're a part of people's lives, then there's no reason why they shouldn't be part of this discourse, you know, that we call television. Mm. Um, and so actually, I think a number of things that we've done have had something that seemed a little controversial at the time, you know, whether it's transparent, which has become like a lot less controversial, thankfully, over the past couple of years. But um, uh, Hand of God, Man in the High Castle, even, like, I think, you know, there's something, uh, I don't know, um, scary about the idea of what if World War II had gone the other way, and there's sort of a lot of issues there. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think in the new era of television, you know, there are so many people making television that, um, you know, I don't see it, I don't see, like, the job as being, um, they've traditionally called it, 
programming, but I, I really think you have to think of it more as eventizing, and it, it's a little bit more like the record business. You're, you're just focused on creating, uh, creating a great album and not so much focused on the other people or counter-programming, whatever they're doing at Wednesday at 9.30 or whatever. And so if you're eventizing, you really, it needs to be big, it needs to be distinctive and really worth talking about. And so sometimes part of that may be, you know, engaging with issues or something unusual that hasn't been talked about in this context. So um, I wouldn't really say it's like a religious show. They don't sit around and debate you know, Matthew 10, 14, or what have you. Um, but it does have that sort of supernatural element, and, and, um, and a lot of people engaged with that, you know, in the comments on the pilot, um, uh, which were overwhelmingly positive on the whole. But it was interesting that people felt that that element was, was kind of a new and fresh element of the show that, um, that that was you know recognized in this in this universe as being important, uh, and some people felt that the show was like anti-religious, and some people complained uh, that it was a little too pro-religious, and so maybe they struck exactly the right balance, and you know, uh, so yeah, we didn't shy away from that. Okay, I think now for the third time we can have a look at it. Hand of God, and uh, I'll repeat, there is a screening at six, and Ron Perlman will be there along with the show's creators and other cast members, so at the film house if you want to go and see it. Now, I was always struck with the Amazon Studios website because it had very clear sort of, this is how you do it. You know, you submit your script. Within 45 days, you'd get a yes-no decision. If it was a yes, you'd get a, a certain amount of money, and it would go into the development process. Right. Whereas in the UK... I think the rules are you get acknowledgement that they've received your idea in 42 days. So there was only a three-day crossover window. You could submit to both, and there was a three-day chance that you'd get caught out. So, but how, how much of the, the stuff that gets made comes through that portal, and how much comes in through more traditional routes? Well, we've done 49 pilots, and three of them have been uh, from shows, uh, pilots uploaded to the site. Um, so, uh, so, and one of them we greenlit, and we're making it now. It's called Vortimer Gibbons' Life on Normal Street. I think it's a really fun uh, live action show for kids 6 to 11, and um, it was submitted by a teacher in Southern California, and it was very cool. It's kind of Pete and Pete-ish. Um, uh, but so it's uh, three out of, out of 48, about one out of 16, so that's like 6.25%. It's, um, uh, so it's, you know, it's like not the bulk of what we do, yeah, but I, I'm definitely happy to have it. Uh, it's and do you ever see themes or d is it useful to see themes? Do you get themes of things being submitted or do you see that suddenly people are wanting to pitch ideas in a certain space? Is it useful even at that level to... Um, you know, there's a lot that comes in and so, you know, you have to, it, you know, they're readers and it comes through. And um, I'm not sure that we see a lot of themes coming all at once, you know, but, but you do have, of course, recurring themes. Yeah. So 6% made through the, that yeah. submission route. My math tells me 94% made through the traditional route. Yeah. How does that work? I mean, so that works kind of in the tradition? normal way, you know, agents, managers, producers, meeting with, meetings with writers, talent, uh, book rights, you know, um, and kind of the normal set of meetings and deals that you would expect at any, any network or studio. So what, people email you or the, how, I mean, how do they, or do you have to go, ABC, for example, you have to go to an agent, are you agent only or you take direct approaches from producers or? Uh, well, no, we take things in from producers and agents, managers, you know, whoever. We're just looking to get great shows. We don't like have a lot of rules yet. Uh, over time, we're going to try to develop um, a lot of rules, some of which are contradictory, and a lot of bureaucracy. <laughs> so we can sort of, things can go slowly, and we can have kind of hopefully <laughs> ambiguous and contradictory notes <laughs> and stuff like that. So those are some of our aspirations. Then you'll have arrived. Then, yeah. you, can, then you can be yeah. a broadcaster. Yeah. And, uh, but I, you know, so they just come in and there's a comedy team, there's kids team, there's drama team, there's a movie team. 
uh, and and so they all flow in through the normal executive departments. And what's the nature of the deal here? If an independent producer gets something commissioned by a network, under terms of trade, they get 85% of the back end. Do you do those sorts of deals? Do you have set terms of trade, or is it deal by deal? Or is it's, it how good is your lawyer? It's pretty much deal, you know, deal by deal. I mean, there's, there's a rough outline or conventional deal. Uh, if we're the studio, so we're making a deal with you as a producer, or with a writer or whatever, um, those are quite recognizable from sort of normal studio deals uh, in that area. And, um, and then if we're sort of the network and we're dealing with a third party studio, then, um, then those are also, they, they kind of look like normal network deals. So, you know, we want to make it easy. So we just kind of, again, the, the only thing we care about is getting great shows. So. We're not like looking to break some revolutionary new ground on the deal front. Like whatever the deal is, that's a deal. Great, let's do it. Um, and yeah, so if you're a producer, there's back end. I don't know if you get 85 points. That sounds like a lot, but, uh, but you know we can we can work on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so to get a, a a better idea or a deeper idea of what you're looking for, we're going to look at another show. Uh, now, this one, you've been working with Ridley Scott and X-Files creator Frank Spotnitz on the show called The Man in the High Castle. Do you want to give us an introduction and then we'll watch a clip? So, The Man in the High Castle is based, based on the fabulous Philip K. Dick novel, The Man in the High Castle. Um, and it takes on the world where uh, Germany and Japan won World War II, and Germany like controls the east coast of the U.S. and Japan the west. And, uh, and there's kind of a, an emerging underground, and there's some kind of little supernatural element that they're trying to figure out. And um, that show comes out at the end of the year in December. Okay, can we see the man in the high castle, please? <laughs> so what was, the, what was the feedback that you got so that was one of the pilots you put up on the side. What yeah. was the feedback that you got? Uh, people dug it big time. Right. Uh, Man in the High Castle was super popular. Um, overwhelmingly positive, interesting, fresh, new, shocking, exciting, super high stakes. Any sense of how many Can't views go it gets as a it got as a pilot? Many. <laughs> many. Tens of thousands, hundreds uh, of thousands? More than that. Yeah, hundreds of thousands. More than, more than that. And it must be an advantage because those of us who've been commissioners, you know, you sort of play God, you know, this project over this project. Must be an advantage in having your hunches validated by a big data set of people before you go to a... Yeah, I mean, it's great. I mean, I would definitely not, I would have no interest in going back. Like if, um, uh, you know, I mean, if we ran a restaurant and we were thinking of putting chili on the menu, we'd make it a special, see if people order it, right? And it's, it's the actual audience that you can go to uh, and you get real feedback and see if people dig it and are intrigued. And um, uh, so, so it's great. And uh, I think everybody should do it. And I think we, we get a lot out of it. How would, I don't, were you a, a traditional commissioner before you took on this role? Uh, I was in, yeah, I was at Disney on the studio side, uh, TV animation. Um, how did it feel doing it this way compared to doing it that way? Uh, well, I definitely like the pilot process better because if you just have a focus group, it's easier to dismiss, and I don't, I don't think the feedback is as helpful. Uh, so I think the process here is um, uh, less random, and I do think you know making the pilot, putting it in front of a really large audience, and getting feedback in the entertainment biz business, you never know what's going to happen. But I, I do think it makes it less speculative, and you can be you know, proceed with, you know, confidence. Okay. We're going to look at a third show now that's gaining profile, and that's Transparent. Um, for those who haven't seen it, can you give us a brief synopsis of uh, Series 1 um, and a sense of what will happen in Series 2? Uh, Transparent is about the Pfefferman family in Los Angeles. They have uh, not been entirely honest with one another over the course of time. Uh, but, uh, but the sort of patriarch of the family uh, makes a bold decision to 
uh, to start being honest about his, his most profound secret, which is that he, is, he wants to and intends to transition into being a woman, and, um, and it unleashes sort of the whole family and their secrets and their conflicts. And um, in season one, we focus on uh, the Mora story uh, we get the whole family in, but uh, but season two is about sort of the continuation of all those threads that were created in in uh, season one of what you call series one. Okay, so we're now going to take a look at an exclusive preview of series two. It's only been seen by the television critics in mm -hmm. Los Angeles, Pasadena. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's have a look at the uh, transparent clip, please. Transparent, up for how many Emmys? 11. 11 Emmys. Yeah, yeah. I, I think Transparent is an interesting example of, um, you know, I, I think traditionally a lot of people have talked about the lead characters in a, in a show being sort of universally relatable. And uh, sometimes the bad version of that is you wind up with lead characters who wind up being a bit too generic and broad. And I, I, think, I think one thing Transparent shows is that the, the important thing is that the emotional, uh, the emotions and the emotional aspirations of the characters are relatable. And they're conveyed in a way that brings you in, gets you on board, and the audience feels the emotion. The idea that the protagonist has to have uh, sort of generic characteristics in order to be universally relatable I think that's actually false. I think the protagonist can be very, very specific and have rough edges and be a very particular person. And if you get the emotion part right, it just makes it all the more real, you know? And so th this is a good example of that. And I, th I think we, you know, kind of buy into that theory generally. You know, Macbeth isn't interesting because I'm interested in like Scottish succession or whatever. It's interesting because there are emotions that are exciting that people get into. So. That's kind of a, um, so we have a few questions here. Before uh, you go to the yeah, questions, because yeah. we'll come to some of the okay. questions while, we're, while the vote's being tallied. So we're now going to use you as a real life um, Amazon focus group. Uh, those of you who've got the festival app, we're going to show you two trailers, one for Casanova and one for Sneaky Pete. And we want you to vote. Uh, whether or not you think they should be, they should go to series. Don't Google it and spoil the fun. Just stay in the moment, people. So, uh, Casanova first, followed by Sneaky Pete, and then vote either, both, or none you think should go to series. So uh, let's show Casanova, and then when that's finished, please show Sneaky Pete. Okay, Sneaky Pete, option two. And if you think both, then option three. Now, while those votes are being tallied, we've go, we're going to take the first three or four questions that came in. Uh, we haven't got long, so fairly brief answers. Do you think TV executives think God is speaking to them? Hand of God style. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yes, definitely. Yourself included definitely or just in my the case. other TV executives? Definitely in my case. You have a direct channel. <laughs> um, you have access to better data than most platforms. How can that help you improve content? Um, well, I mean, mainly we use it in the pilot process. I, I think you can also, when you're looking at a book property, learn a lot about, you know, how people are engaging with that. Uh, so you take the data book. from Amazon book sales and yeah, we what they highlight books. and all of that other. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And really uh, so that's helpful. The, um, I think the thing of having like specific notes within an episode, like I think on page 17, this character shouldn't do that. I don't think that really plays into it. No. Um, at that level of granularity, you really want to be um, helping the creator realize their vision, not having, you know, so, so if you keep it at the right level, then it's very helpful. Um. Would you consider entering the world of on-demand entertainment, shiny floor type formats? Dancing with the Stars. I, I would never it. rule anything out. You know, when they were pitching uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, I mean, they must have been like 
uh, it, it was, it, that was an example of something that I think 90% of network executives would have agreed at the time was a horrendous idea. It was so rejected I, many times. And yeah, many times absolutely. And uh, so I'd never say never, but we're not into, I'm not actually sure what a shiny floor show is. Dancing I think it's like a variety stars. show. Yeah, Dancing with the Stars. Oh yeah, no, well, we're, def we're not doing that now. Not doing that now. Yeah. But left your option open. Uh, last question, uh, has any work-related incident caused you to cry at your desk? <laughs> I'm afraid not. Yet. Yeah. Let's leave it open. <laughs> okay, do Maybe we have... some of the more emotional scenes of our shows, but that would be desirable. Or work with more British producers. Yeah. Um, do we have the answer to the press? Oh, we do. And the answer is your vote. Oh, Sneaky interesting. Pete is the winner. All right. I'll let you know soon. And the real result is both of them have been. Both have gone to series? No? No, no. No, no we haven't been. announced the real results. So we'll, oh, we'll announce the real results. Oh, OK. And, uh, and we'll see. We'll take it into account. Um, my, very... money's on, my money's on both. OK. Because sex always sells. How much? Anyway, I'm afraid we've run out of time, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so for those of you who want to go see Hand of God, it's on at the Playhouse, 6 o'clock. Can I just ask you before you go to thank Roy Price and the studios? <laughs>